wave to each other. Okay, please have a seat. I need a comment this morning that anywhere else in the world that we have ever lived, we would not have had church this morning. <laughs> but we live in Canada now, and so it was just, you know, not much at all. So we are glad that you are here. We're glad that you are here, whether you're in the sanctuary, over in Lockwood Hall, or somewhere else in our world. Maybe you're at home here in the valley with your cup of coffee looking out over this gorgeous snow. Wherever you are, we are glad that you have chosen to be a part of worship here today at Port Williams United Baptist Church. This week, along with our friends in the Wolfville Area Interchurch Council, we have been observing the week of prayer for Christian unity. We'll conclude this afternoon with a service at Wolfville Baptist Church at 4 o'clock. Um, invite you to be a part of it. We're also going to be commemorating the 50th anniversary of Wake and all the things that we have been able to do together I encourage you to join us either in person. Uh, my understanding is it is going to be online. Uh, the details for all of that are on the Wake website. I encourage you to look that up. This is another one of those ways in which we are aware that we can't do everything that we need to, that we want to do alone. Uh, that's why we join together with other people in our area to make a difference in our world. That's why we're excited to be a part of the coldest night of the year walk again this year. And I want to recognize Ron Baxter to tell us more about that. Thank you, Don. And good morning. And I think we could probably declare this to be the coldest morning of the year so far. Um, to begin with, I want to give a bit of background information about the coldest uh, night of the year walk. Uh, for a number of years, Port Williams has taken part in that, um, and it's been wonderful to see each year uh, young people and older people signing up to do that walk and to also do fundraising. And I want to say thank you to those who have already, this year, uh, signed up to be a part of the team and also to those who have made donations. The coldest night of the year walks began 10 years ago in 2011 in two locations in Ontario when just over 400 walkers raised uh, $111,000. Our Annapolis Valley Coldest Night Walk, hosted by the Open Arms Society in Kentville, joined eight years ago in 2013. So we fast forward to 2020 when over 26,000 walkers in 144 locations across Canada, raised a record $6.25 million. This year in 2021, COVID-19 will not prevent the walk or fundraising, but things will be done a little differently. In Kentville, it's going to be an outdoor event only, but also Annapolis Valley teams have the option of walking in their own communities and that's what the Port Williams truckers will be doing. Uh, we'll be walking here in Port Williams on the afternoon of February 20th, and more information will be available about that when we get closer to the date. The coldest night of the year is a time when tens of thousands of Canadians step outside the warmth and comfort of home and shine a light of welcome and inclusion to those experiencing homelessness, hurt, and hunger in our communities. And I want to share a little bit of information that came from the Open Arms Society in Kentville. And they say, many terrific things have taken place in the face of the challenges this past year. Hundreds of homes have received essential emergency supports, and many others provided with additional helps and supports through our COVID-19 response program, Neighbor to Neighbor. The need for adequate and affordable housing has only worsened with rental rates increasing for those few available places. We are poised to lead the way in developing creative and equitable housing solutions alongside our day-to-day -day focus on supporting people in crisis. In From the Cold is now hosted from one location with COVID-19 safety protocols and dedicated rooms so that youth, male and female guests can see can sleep separately and safely. The lack of available housing is already contributing to higher numbers and longer stays. Emergency shelter is not a complete solution, 
but there is always a steady flow of people requiring this temporary crisis support. We are typically supporting six to 12 individuals facing homelessness at any given time. Our thrift store, Oats, is developing into a true social enterprise, dispersing items for people in need and creating a space for work and training for persons with obstacles to employment. There is a donation drop-off site in the driveway at the Kentville Outreach Center at 32 Cornwallis Street in Kentville. All profits from items sold supports open arms programming. Meals are provided for 40 to 80 each day at our Kentville location, which has also nine shelter beds. Outreach in Berwick and Kingston areas has been focused on food supports and connecting remotely these past months. Our reach has increased significantly, but our capacity to support people in need is challenging with social distancing requirements. Open Arms is a gift from the community to the community, as programming costs are covered entirely by private donations, supporting businesses, churches, and fundraising. Our network of volunteers from churches and the community work to provide food, shelter, housing, and much more for men, women, youth, and families in crisis. Open Arms serves as a community for people with long-term challenges and a bridge for those seeking to establish healthy independence. By assisting people with basic needs and offering guidance to the tools and resources they need, we regularly witness the power of God's love at work, restoring hope, dignity, and purpose to those who were formerly without hope. So as you've heard, there are great needs in our community, and by participating in the coldest night of the year walk, we are able to uh, help either as joining the team to walk or to provide donations, and in that way, we can make a difference in the lives of others. I want to express my appreciation to my friends here in the Port Williams area, and particularly for the group of walkers who were so much a part of our yeah, year ago walk. But with the change of uh, life due to COVID, we are pleased to be able to offer a walk in our own village for this year. And we hope that uh, many of you will choose to register as walkers. And you, you can do so by picking up the promotional uh, page uh, from the uh, counter outside uh, in the main vestibule of this church. And also, we want to encourage you to encourage others to log on to the Coldest Night website and through that source, both register as a walker and also make a donation to our Trekker team. And with that in mind, I want to recognize also my uh, appreciation for the technical folk here in the Port Williams Baptist Church because for the sake of those who are in the sanctuary, you're just getting a view of me and a poster held up so you can see it. For folk who are on the screen, watching the screen, they've just got the poster now. And so they can do without me, except I will tell them that we are aiming a, a, a conservative amount of $2,000 as a, as a goal. But remembering what happened last year, we're calling this a sliding goal. And because we raised 2,500 last year, I'm quite sure that we will see that goal slide up another $1,000 at least. And so with that in mind, I want to encourage you to be supporters of the Coldest Night Walk and I want to encourage as many as possible to sign up as walkers. We will leave from the parking lot here at Port Williams Baptist Church. We will do a two kilometer walk around this block, which many people walk. And then we're going to add another 2.7 kilometers so that we can get the full five kilometers that we are asked to make 
in the coldest night walk. And so with that, I want to thank you in advance for all that you are committing to as a congregation, as the people of Port Williams, and others who will choose to support the coldest walk, our team and other teams throughout the Annapolis Valley. Thank you. Sharon, I did not know that you were going to help us, so thank you. I do want to express my appreciation to Ron and Sharon for heading up and cheering our team again this year. Another reminder that this Wednesday evening we're going to have an information session concerning our church's move and desire to help bring about reconciliation with our indigenous neighbors. Um, David Duke and Paul Vino will be helping us understand what land acknowledgement means and what it doesn't mean and why it's important. Uh, that session will be on Zoom. Uh, the details are on our website, and so we invite you to join us as a part of that. We are glad that you are here this morning, a time when we can listen and again hear God's call to us, a time when we can pause and remember the very foundation of our lives. So may we now center ourselves, take a breath, and join together as we worship our God. Let us pray. O Holy One, God of all creation, you call us to be your people, to carry your vision in this time and place. You call us to go where you send us, to help welcome your amazing good news. As we gather in the presence of Christ to spread the news that your realm is near, fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your spirit, O God, that we may share your good news with a world so in need of good news this day. In your name we pray. Amen.
The invitation is given to every person by Jesus Christ. Come to me, follow me, be my disciples. We come to this place, to this time, at the invitation of Jesus Christ. In the name of Christ. We accept the invitation to discipleship. In the name of Christ. As his disciples, we worship and praise God. In the midst of a world where cruelty abounds. We proclaim the God of compassion. In the midst of despair that threatens to swallow up whole lives, whole peoples. We proclaim the God of hope. In the midst of indifference and apathy. We proclaim the God of love. Come, let us worship together and share a witness of God's living presence in the world. Reading from Psalm 62. To the leader, according to Jejuthun, a psalm of David. For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall never be shaken. How long will you assail a person? Will you batter your victim, all of you, as you would a leaning wall, a tottering fence? Their only plan is to bring down a person of prominence. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. Salah. For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Salah. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. Put no confidence in extortion and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God and steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord. For you repay all you repay to all according to their work. This is time for our children for us to share a few moments together, so I invite you to come and be with us. Do you collect something? Do you have something that you collect? Like what? We collect stuff at our house. We collect dust. No, I'm just joking. That's what I collect. I need a th and, and then I collect it, and need, then Anita throws it out. I think it's very rude of her. Anita has a collection, though. And I started to bring it, but it was too heavy. See, Anita collects rocks. Not really fancy, fancy rocks, not exquisite rocks, but just rocks. Everywhere we go, sometime in the trip, Anita will say, here's a rock. We have rocks from South Carolina, of course. We have rocks from West Virginia, where she grew up. We have rocks from England. We have rocks from Prague. We have rocks from China, we have rocks from Australia, we have rocks from Bali, we have rocks and rocks and rocks and rocks. And they are heavy to move. We've moved them twice in the past three years. And at times I think, why do you, why do you collect these? And she says, she collects them to remember, to remember where we have been. But even more, she collects them for something solid to hold on to. The scripture that Elizabeth just read for us talks about God is my rock. God is my rock. 
God is the one. You know, rocks don't change. We've had some of these rocks for 20, 30 years, and it's still, it's still a rock. I collect pictures. I, collect, I take photos, and I take them, and some of them we've printed out. But you know, some of those pictures don't look the same now because the light has faded them out. They don't look the same. But those rocks, they stay the same. God is like that. God doesn't change. God holds firm and says to us, this is something to build your life on. So I invite you, as you collect stuff in your life, collect the stuff that makes a difference. Collect the stuff that won't change. Even more, though, build your life on something solid like God. Let's pray. God, we thank you for being our foundation, our rock. We pray that we will build lives that will reflect the stability and love that you give us. In your name we pray. Amen. Our New Testament reading this morning comes from Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 20. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were, both, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Let us pray. God, we hear this scripture, and we hear people talking about you calling people, and we immediately somehow think of mystical experiences when we hear a voice calling in the night, someone calling us to do something amazing, awe-inspiring and miraculous. And God, there are times when that happens. But most of the time, it happens more like your call of the disciples, They were just going about their lives, doing the things that they had always done. They were fishermen, and that's what they knew. But you called to them and said, follow me, and I'll make you fish for people. Maybe it was the call. This is something new, but more than likely it was something... Well, they couldn't quite put their finger on it, but it had their name written all over it. God, you continue to call men and women, us even, to follow you. You call us to take what we know, what we do, and widen our vision to encompass the whole world. Follow me and I will make you teach the world. Follow me and I'll make you heal the world. Follow me and I'll make you feed the world. The very call seems overwhelming. The world? The whole world? And it might be that global, oh God, but it might just be the world in which we live. The people next door, those down the street, those here in the valley. You call us. It starts there. You call us. Help us to hear that call. Help us to follow. Help us change your world. As did the one who continues to call us even this day, in whose name we pray. Amen.
It's really amazing, isn't it, these days to drive up Collins Road? I mean, even in the middle of a pandemic, it seems like they are just inflating houses over there. And what was once an empty lot yesterday, it seems, today it's a brand new house. They're putting them up so often, so fast over there that our missions and outreach committee is almost running out of jam to take in our welcoming kits, so much construction, so if you have any jam, just hold on, we may be needing it very soon. And it's not just on that street, even across the river at the bottom of our house. It's not a new construction, and, and yet it, it sort of is. There's this house that has been there forever, I mean, at least as long as we have been there, that, that suddenly it has been transformed into something totally new and different. I've watched. For a while, there was this huge digger there that seemed to be digging out a new basement. But now, they've just put a whole new addition. Well, the basement is there. But there's a whole new addition there, and the, it's changing day by day. So much construction. Now, I'm not an engineer. I know enough about, I know so little about construction that I'm not a danger to anyone. But I do know 
But I do know that an essential a must-have for any building is the foundation, what you're building it on. In Charleston, we built two facilities, and I watched. I watched as the foundation was poured after trenches had been dug and, and things. See, I don't know construction. The things had been placed in there. And I watched as they had as they brought in tons and tons and truckloads of dirt and let it settle. And then we poured about seven inches of concrete down to give the building something to sit on. I learned that the last thing you want in a construction, the last thing you need is an unsteady foundation. It's not part of our scripture lesson this morning, but Jesus apparently knew something about construction because in one of his parables, he said, don't build on sand. Don't put it on, on sand. Put it on something sturdy like, like rock. You need a good foundation to build on. Relax. I'm not going to propose a building campaign for us this morning. At least not a physical building. But the truth is that each of us is constantly always involved in a building campaign. We're building our lives. So the question is always on what are you building your life? In many ways, it would be simple. It would be simple, wouldn't it, if we could just go over to home hardware and get the stuff for our lives. And go and get some lumber and provide the structure, some wires for our thoughts and our emotions. Go down the plumbing aisle to get the pipes for our generosity. We could just go in with our check-off list and then just build our lives. It would be so much easier. But that's not how lives are built. They are not built with stuff. The truth is, they are built with and they are built on stories. Each morning I receive an email from Catholic priest Richard Rohr. Last week he was... He was talking about another person that I so admire, Brian McLaren. And McLaren, in his writing, was saying, was talking about our framing stories. Stories that give people direction, values, vision, the inspiration that provide a framework for our lives. McLaren said it tells them who they are, where they are from, where they are, where they are, what's going on, where things are going, and what they should do. Our framing stories. And I read that, and it was one of those times in which I just went down the rabbit hole. I went down the rabbit hole, and it ended up in McLa with McLaren's latest, one of his latest books, The Seventh Story. It's a follow-up book to a children's book that he did with Garrett Higgins, it's a short, wonderful read that I highly recommend. I want you to hear it so much that I want you to hear the first chapter this morning. Brian McLaren. There once was a people. Let's call them the people. The people use stories to interpret their lives, stories of where they came from, stories of where they were going, Stories that told them how to be happy. Stories that told them where they are. The stories say that one day a long time ago, one of the people saw another one of the people holding up something shiny. I want it, said one of these people. And so he took it. When he got back home that night, the rest of the people were amazed. Because I have a shiny object, he proclaimed, you have to listen to me. And he told them a story about what he had learned, about how to be happy, how to have peace and security, how to keep the shiny thing that he had found. The first story said that the way to be happy is to rule over others. But every time that story was attempted, people were unhappy because the rulers oppressed them. So another story was invented. Let's overthrow the rulers. This story didn't work either because it just turned the tables, putting new people under oppression. 
So another story began in which the old revolutionaries withdrew into their own isolated spaces and judged the world. But nothing changed because these island communities used the same old stories to run themselves, competing, about being to, competing to be in charge, building shiny object factories which blew ugly smoke into the air, air making everyone cough and dominating each other. Meanwhile, the domination story and the isolation story had a merger business which resorted, resulted in an experiment. If they could get rid of the people they didn't like, who looked or sounded different, or whose customs weren't like their own, surely, surely that would fix things. But that just led to more suffering of those who were blamed and targeted, who felt unsafe, and of those who thought they were in charge because they missed out on the gift of the rainbow. They all lived in a gray world. The people still weren't happy, and they knew it. And so they began to, oh, I forgot, to be distracted. They began to create. Oh, look at that. A new shiny object. How lovely. I would want one of those. How can I get one? A lot of years went by. The people tried to convince themselves that things were okay by accumulating things. Toys or nations, it was all the same to them. Some of the people knew such things don't heal the soul. And the other stories hadn't gone away either. The people kept hurting and hurting each other. So a final story was created that said... If we can't find peace, security, and happiness by ruling the world or withdrawing or isolating or getting rid of the minority they didn't like or by accumulating things, they could make sure that they never forgot this lack, this pain that the others had caused them and the suffering they had experienced. These people decided that they would make sure no one would ever forget that they were the victims, that their suffering was their very identity, and that no one had ever suffered as much as they had. And if you try to tell them that others had suffered too, well, they might just kill you. And then, something new. A poet came to town, a storyteller that knew that the domination story, the revolution story, the isolation story, the purification story, the accumulation story, the victimization story, they were all destined to fail because they invited every human being who is already interdependent with every other human being and even with the earth itself, to pretend that they're in a competition instead. This poet knew how to build things like tables where we could all sit and eat together. She taught that pe the people most oppressed by the six stories should be the most honored. Taught that the kind of differences that the people's story shame or use an excuse for punishment were actually the marks of what make us most lovable. She invited people to join her in forming a new community where status would depend on service, where domination would be replaced by equitable community, where the revolution of the heart would lead us to share power with, not power over, transforming the process by which we lead and learn where deadening isolation would be replaced by rejuvenating silences, where we would learn from and celebrate folks on the margins, where we would share, not possess, and heal each other's wounds in a new story, not of victimhood or power over, but of forgiving each other, co-conspiring only beauty. This poet had a radical idea, the seed of a seventh story that will heal the world. 
The six earlier stories all claimed that the path to peace, security, and happiness was all about winning us over them or us overthrowing them, or us staying apart from them, or us cleansing ourselves of them, or us having the things that they don't, or us being more important to them because of our competitive suffering. But in the seventh story, the story of reconciliation, we still get to win, just, at, just not at another's expense. In the seventh story, human beings are not the protagonist of the world. Love is. In the seventh story, humans are participants in something far bigger than being reduced to dominating others for one group's gain or the pursuit of happiness through revolutions that replace one dominance with another or isolation or purity or being victims or gaining possessions. In the seventh story, Humans are participant in the biggest thing that has ever happened of the evolution of good, of the expansion of consciousness to include the restoration and healing of all things. The story of love. It is a story in which some of us know that our purpose is not merely ourselves, but all of us. Some of us for all of us. They killed the poet, of course. The seventh story was, much, was too much to take for people with visions limited to the narrow circle of self. But the poet didn't actually die. Her story is alive. Alive right now. It lives wherever someone reveals the other stories as failures. The story lives every time someone lives for all of us or offers a glass of cold water to a thirsty stranger or a blanket to a naked person or engages in sacred practices of friendship, lament, and hope. The story lives wherever there are exchanges of power and gifts between the strong and the vulnerable, creating community. The story lives wherever there are artistic endeavors that show us we are not alone and tell us where to go next and remind some of us to live for all of us because there is no them. Seven different stories. The story of domination of revolution, of isolation, of purification, of accumulation, of victimization, and a story of love. Which one will you live? Which one are you building your life on? I suspect that Part of the problem in our world is that oftentimes we try to build on multiple foundations, on multiple stories. And that's just not possible. The stories conflict, leading to conflict in us, with us. We have to choose. Because we can only, only live one. That's the word from the psalmist. There's a small word that appears over and over and over in our lesson this morning. In, in Hebrew, it's the word ak. It appears six times in this psalm. What makes it significant is that in the entire book of Psalms, it only appears 24 times. One fourth appear in this one psalm. Maybe, maybe the psalmist is telling us something. Maybe they're saying, you need to pay attention to this word. Ak carries with it a restrictive meaning. It means alone, only. It also means, has a assertive meaning, truly, indeed. 
when we read our translations, we have to choose which word, which meaning we're going to use. But in Hebrew, it sort of means both. They come combined. To wait for the Lord alone means to wait on God indeed. To truly hope in God means that you can only find your hope only, only in God. Each of us. Each of us must choose our God just as we have to as we get to choose our story. That will determine how we live, what we strive for, who will be our God. Domination, revolution, isolation, purification, Accumulation, victimization, love. What is your story? Who is your God? On what will you build your life? Again, let me thank you for being here. You know the old saying goes that life gives you lemon, make lemonade. Well, here it's like the world gives you snow, make snowmen. That's what our youth are going to be doing this evening at youth group. They had already planned. How is this for prophetic visionary planning? Put the calendar together and say on the 24th of January, we're going to have our snowman, snow person building contest. That's what they're going to be doing this afternoon, this evening at 6.30 here at the church. You might want to come and see. I sort of think you should have had an adult division also, but at least come by tomorrow and see the remnants, the, the congregation of snow people who will be out uh, adorning our, our yard um, at 6.30 this evening for our youth group. I invite you to be a part invite you if you're going to, to come and be a part of our wake um, worship service at 4 o'clock at Wolfville Baptist uh, as we conclude our week of prayer for Christian unity. Uh, Wednesday night, our session uh, on land acknowledgement. And do not forget to go and sign up to be a part of our Port Williams Trekkers for coldest night of the year. Do thank you for being here for worship. But as we heard in our gospel lesson, God calls us and then sends us out. Sends us out to do the things that we need to do for God. So as we go, may we hear our benediction. You are the people of God, 
So go now, and as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord bless you and start again. You are the people of God. So go now, and as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And God give you grace never to sell yourself short. Grace to risk something big for something good. Grace to remember that our world is too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. So go now, and as you go, may the Lord take your hands and work through them. May the Lord take your lips and speak through them. May the Lord take your hearts and set them on fire, both now and forevermore.